Welcome everyone. There we go. <laughs> Welcome to all of our new and returning Great Muzzle friends joining us today. We are thrilled you are here. We look forward to opportunities such as this to connect and educate on senior dog well-being. We're very excited to offer safe autumn foods for your senior dog plus choking safety techniques presented by Great Muzzle's very own special guest, Denise Fleck. To share a bit about Great Muzzle, for those that may be new to us, the Great Muzzle organization is one of the only national organizations dedicated specifically to advancing life-saving efforts on behalf of senior dogs. We provide funding and resources to animal shelters and rescue groups nationwide. In July, we announced awarding 700,000 in grants to 78 animal welfare groups in the United States, Puerto Rico, and Canada, working to save and improve the lives of senior dogs. This brings the National Gray Muzzle Organization's total grant funding to more than 3.8 million since 2008. We are exceptionally proud of the work we do and are blessed to have a community of Gray Muzzle supporters that believe in saving senior dogs. We're gonna just do a quick, uh, few quick introductions. I'm Laura Merrick, I'm Gray Muzzle's Communications and Impact Manager. We are joined by Lisa Lunghopper, who's Gray Muzzle's Executive Director, Amanda Grant, Gray Muzzle's Administrator, and Heather Hayes, Gray Muzzle's Creative Content Manager. And of course, it is my honor to introduce Denise Fleck. She is no stranger to Gray Muzzle. Denise not only leads Gray Muzzle serving as the board president, she is an award-winning author and animal care instructor who developed the curriculum for her pet first aid and CPR. Is it CPRC and pet disaster preparedness? Yes, there actually is a second C. Okay. <laughs> I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, great. So it's CPR, C CPCR and pet disaster preparedness classes after training with dozens of schools and organizations, practicing, attending seminars, and practicing some more. Known as the Pet Safety Crusader, Denise has personally taught more than 30,000 humans, animals, life-saving skills, and has appeared on Animal Planet's Rumor Has It and Pit Boss. A&E's Kirstie Alley's Big Life, CBS TV's The Doctor, CNN Headline News, PBS TV's Lassie's Pet Vet, and KTLA Los Angeles, as well as on radio and in magazines. Um, as I mentioned before, she is the president of the Board of Great Muzzle Organization and has a soft spot um, for caring for senior pets. Uh, before we turn the floor over to Denise, I'm just going to have a quick reminder to enter any questions you have into the question box um, in Zoom if you're attending that way, or go ahead and enter questions in the comments if you are joining us on Facebook. And we'll be sure to address your questions at the end of this webinar. So now I will turn the floor over to Denise to share with us this perfectly perfect fit for the season, safe autumn foods for your senior dog plus choking safety techniques. Thank you so much, Laura. And let me just lead off with that so that everybody does understand there now is a second C in CPR. It's CPCR, cardiopulmonary cerebral resuscitation. Although we'll probably always use the CPR an acronym because it's just a lot easier to say, but the um, changes came maybe five or six years ago when we changed some techniques to emphasize getting blood and oxygen to the brain, the cerebral part of the body. Because as much as we want that heart and lungs to work, if the brain isn't working, we don't have the pet. So um, there is a second C in CPCR. <laughs> So with that said, I'm delighted to be here. And you know, senior dogs for all of us are part of the family. And they're some of the beings we're most grateful for in our lives. And especially at this time of Thanksgiving, we're always thinking about gratitude and being thankful. But I hope we are thankful for our senior dogs 365 days a year. However, as we get into the autumn season and into the holiday of Thanksgiving, some of us will add different spices and flavors and foods to our table. And although they may smell yummy to our senior dogs, they could be potentially hazardous to Fido, which means you could end up at the emergency room instead of at the family dinner. So I'm gonna go through some of those foods today, what's good, what's not, and also since senior dogs like their younger counterparts sometimes put things in their mouths that they shouldn't or gulp or just take too much food, um, they can choke. 
So we're gonna take you through some basic steps how to manage choking should this happen to your senior pet. Um, Speaking of walking you through some of these steps, today is actually National Take a Hike Day. Now, if you're watching this in replay, it may not be National Take a Hike Day, but you know, that's a wonderful thing, especially at this time of year with all of the autumn leaves on the ground to take a walk with your senior pet. A nice gentle walk to stimulate their eyes, their ears, but mostly their noses because they are all about smelling. So whether it's actually the, the day or just any day of the year, exercise with your pet. And here is my gray muzzle amidst the leaves. This is Kiko. Kiko is a nine-year-old Akita and she's my absolute love bug. So Thanksgiving, we think of harvest. And what harvest means is to reap and to gather. So, you know, people store the fruits that have come to fruition, so to speak. Sometimes they make them into jams and sauces. Um, we cook these up. Sometimes we eat them right away. Sometimes we store them for the colder winter months. These foods are often very good for our senior dogs. What makes them not so good sometimes is what else we add to them and the quantities our pets get into. So just a brief little, I'm, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not gonna even play one on TV here, but what I just wanna show you are, these are the vitamins that senior dogs need going through the alphabet of vitamins. And you know, I'm not gonna go through that so much as I just wanna say vitamins are organic compounds that sustain life. So the, our pets need these in their diet. Many of the things from our Thanksgiving table will provide these, um, but we obviously need to be careful. Other things you'll see that our senior dogs need and can get from foods are enzymes. And enzymes either make things or they break them down. Um, a lack of digested enzymes you know, can be really problematic for our senior pets. It can result in weight loss, it can result in malabsorption, so they're not looking healthy, they could get itchy skin, it may be even um, diarrhea, coprophagia, which is when the dog goes in the backyard and eats what he deposited, or pica, where he just eats anything imaginable. The other thing, the third thing besides the vitamins and the enzymes that our pets or our senior dogs in particular need are our omega-3 fatty acids. Those do so much to help eliminate over um, shedding, makes the skin not itchy. It helps with allergies. It helps with arthritis, kidney support. So, you know, when we're thinking of Thanksgiving and omega-3s, maybe the first thing that could come to people's minds are the nuts in a lot of the food. Um, nuts are very high in fat. And I'm going to talk about them in a little bit more detail in a moment. But really, there are other ways you can get those omega-3s into your senior dog. Spinach, eggs, pumpkin, acorn, and butternut squash. I actually have one over there. And maybe just a very few unsalted pumpkin seed. Now, turkey. Uh, and I was talking with this about um, with Amanda and Laura before we got started here, but turkey is a really good low fat, highly digestible protein for our senior dogs. We're finding more and more um, pets are developing allergies to chicken and chicken actually is higher in saturated fats, just like beef is. So turkey's kind of bland and it, you know, doesn't tend to upset tummies but it does provide the protein needed for those muscles and the energy our dogs need. It's good for their kidney health because um, it's rich in zinc and magnesium. It's good for their skin. It's heart healthy. It improves, um, like I just said, their skin and their coat makes it shiny. And for dogs that have allergies, it's easily digestible. So turkey is a really good choice protein from our table. However, we don't want to add butter and salt. Anything like that is going to be problematic for our pets. We're talking about the, the fat and the salt is bad on the kidneys and both on the heart. So the whole um, mantra, I guess you would say, of my talk today is not so much that the foods are problematic, but it's going to be all of these spices and oils and other things that we add to them that can make them unsuitable for our senior dogs. If we keep a little bit to the side and keep it plain, it's gonna be spot on great for them. 
Now, some people also, or instead of turkey, may have ham on the table. But again, here we're talking salt, sugar, and fat for our senior pets. That said, you know, we all have to go through a drive through once in a while, no matter how healthy our diet is. So, I mean, a tiny piece for your pet as a taste, because it's the holiday, isn't going to be a big deal unless your pet is already known to have pancreatitis or other issues. But just be careful that you give everybody at Thanksgiving table, you know, the, the sweet little lecture so that, you know, you're slipping a little piece of white meat turkey under the table to the dog. Uh, you know, Uncle Bob and Aunt Charlotte and Cousin Jim and the neighbor down the street and everybody else are not also doing the same thing. Because then you are going to end up with a sick pet. Pumpkin is actually a fabulous um, vegetable for our pets. We do want to do it in moderation because it's one of my favorite first aid techniques for um, dealing with constipation and diarrhea. But if you look here, I've spelled out pumpkin for you. I tried to be clever, but the pumpkin is good for the peepers. It's good for the eye health. It keeps the eyes healthy. It's good for urinary and digestive health. It helps manage weight in older dogs. There's so much fiber in it that it's filling. So, um, you know, it kind of makes you feel full without the calories. It's good for parasite control. I'm not gonna say you can feed some pumpkin and you don't have to use your preventives depending on where you live, but it's actually um, good for, I'm trying to think, uh, it's some type of worm. It actually expels tapeworms, that's what it is. And it can help kill other parasites too. It's in a great immune system booster. Most of our vegetables that have these bright colors are, and there's lots and lots of nutrients like you see over there on my little graphic. Basically, pumpkin is a multivitamin for your dog, but one teaspoon, and what I'm talking about is the pureed pumpkin, um, like you see I have here that comes out of the can. Not the pumpkin pie mix, just the pure pumpkin, or you can cook it yourself without the salt and butter. But one teaspoon for every 10 pounds your dog weighs. Um, if you want to give them some of the seeds and that you roast those pumpkin seeds, again, without butter and without salt, you can grind up one seed also for about every 10 pounds the pet weighs. But we're not going to do this every single day, but it's a nice treat around the holidays. Now, if you're wondering about the difference between pumpkin versus sweet potato. You see, I've got it right there for you. Both are e equally fibrous, so they're very beneficial, like I mentioned, if your pet is um, constipated. The sweet potato, though, far outweighs the pumpkin as far as the nutrients, but the pumpkin is less caloric. So it depends on what you're looking for to help your pet, um, but either of those can be good. Again, though, you know my message, without the butter and salt. Now, many vegetables are great, but dogs have shorter intestinal tracts than us humans. Food stays in their tummies a whole lot longer, but then goes more quickly through the intestinal tract. So what that means is their bodies don't have time to basically break down the cellulose, the plant fiber. We need to do that for them. If any of you have dogs that like to chew on carrots, this might be a, a good way for you to realize what I'm talking about. Um, the carrot's crunchy, it may be exercising their gums, maybe scraping a little bit of plaque off their teeth, maybe probably not too much, but there's, it's sweet and they're enjoying it. But the next morning when you take them on a walk and go pick up their poop, um, there's rather large pieces of carrot. Their bodies didn't digest it. So if you really want them to extract the nutrients from vegetables, you either need to chop them very fine, puree them you know, in your blender, or even lightly steam the vegetables first to break down some of that plant fiber so that your pets can actually absorb the nutrients. You'll see over here on the left some really good veggies for your pets. Um, dogs do eat vegetables in the wild. This isn't unusual. Uh, they you know, will eat what they want and eat what they don't want, but what it does is it helps alkalize their tummies and hydrate their systems. Um, carnivores, like our dogs, eat a lot of meat, so that means that their bodies are more acidic. So adding in some vegetables kind of balances out their system. Depending on the veggies, there can be all kinds of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and then again, the fiber, 
which just really helps with their digestion and keeps things flowing through. Because if there isn't enough fiber, um, we sometimes get a blockage. And we all know that we've been told ourselves that the more colorful the vegetables, the better they might be at preventing various cancers. So the thing is everything in moderation, nothing in excess, and you know, giving your pets a little try at various things. Um, some pets aren't gonna like certain vegetables. Um, some may not like vegetables at all. I will tell you my Akita Kiko is a total carnivore. Meat, eggs, and cheese. So I have to sneak veggies into her food without her knowing it because it's just not in her you know, wheelhouse to want to consume veggies. Speaking of which, I've got an idea. And I think some of you already know about it. You um, probably already had a download or we can make sure you have it if you don't already of my turkey veggie muffins for your senior dogs and for you. There's no reason you can't partake in these as well. So I've got the oven preheating over here. And what I've got, I've actually already made half of it to show you. So I've only got a half batch here, but I've got a, ground, uh, a pound of ground turkey breast, a half a cup of that pumpkin puree. Remember again, not pumpkin pie mix. Gonna mix that in here. We've got um, half a cup of oat flour. Now, Everything is expensive in the store these days. You could also use almond flour, but I think that's even more expensive. But what I like doing is just getting regular old oatmeal, old fashioned oatmeal, popping it in you know, my container, putting it in the blender, and I've made oat flour. So this, you know, it can't be any fresher than this. And I'm gonna add that half cup right into my bowl here. I then need my half cup of frozen veggies. It does, they don't have to be frozen. You can cut, right, um, cook fresh ones first. Broccoli is one I often do and kind of break it down. But here I've got the peas and carrots going. A lot of dogs like the peas and carrots because again, the carrots are a little sweet and the peas are a little more starchy than a lot of vegetables. So they'll enjoy that flavor. And then last but not least is the egg, which I've scrambled up. I'm gonna hold this up here for a moment for you guys to see it as I start mixing and blending it together. I haven't done a cooking show, I don't think before here, but um, you get the idea and we're gonna make this all well mixed together. But what did I not put in here? No salt, no spices, no butters. So remember that, but you'll be surprised, um, you know, how amazingly tasty this can be and how your dog will like this. What I typically then do is I've got my muffin tin here already pre-greased. And, you know, we all have our own little techniques, but I typically take a small cookie scoop like this and keep it in that cold water so things don't stick. And I'll just take a scoop of the mixture out at a time and plop it right in that tray. Now, one thing I often do as well is I actually flatten out the top a little bit with the back of it. The reason for that is when they're out of the oven and cool, then I will put a dollop of cranberries in. Now it's best if you get the unsweetened cranberry, but once again, I will say that, you know, we're just getting a teeny little taste. So as long as you and everybody else in the family isn't getting sweetened cranberries, you can do so. I find that many of the dogs find it a little bit too bitter without, you know, just a hint of sugar. But anything that's sweetened, please, 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 <coughs> excuse me, always read labels and make sure there's no xylitol, X-Y-L-I-T-O-L, -L, an artificial sweetener that sometimes goes under the names of um, birch sugar, birch bark extract, or even sugar alcohols. When we get that all in the tray, I'm gonna pop it in the oven here, get it preheating. And um, we're gonna cook it for 20 minutes at 350 degrees. And when it's cool, you don't wanna burn those canine tongues, serve it with a smile. And I'm pretty sure you're gonna get a wow. Let's see if I can get this to play for you. Princess Kika.
So you see, whoops, I didn't need to play that again. So you see they are a hit and you can certainly use other types of meat in there. You can use the beef, the chicken, the lamb, but remember again, both beef and chicken are a little higher in saturated fat. You can use um, meat substitutes. I am all about impossible burgers lately. I love using that for meatloafs and meatballs and all kinds of things, but I do don't feel my dog needs to be a vegetarian. So um, giving the turkey, I think, is a good option for them. But if you're making some of these for you too, you can certainly use plant-based options. Now, I mentioned that I was gonna put just a little dollop of cranberries on top of that, just to make it a little more festive. And like for us, cranberries fight, fight inflammation, they're good for the kidneys, um, they support the immune system and have great vitamins. Cinnamon too is a, a nice little thing to add to the holiday season. And what I like about it for our dogs is it stimulates their sniffer. You guys, I know we don't have smell a zoom here today, but I've actually been simmering some cinnamon on the stove all morning just to kind of get me in that festive mood. I love the smell of cinnamon at the house. And it really helps improve brain function in our senior dogs. So it isn't that we even have to give them that to um, consume, but just having a little scent of something like that is a good brain stimulator. Do realize though, you know, spraying things in the house are not necessarily good for our pets. Essential oils can be problematic and a lot of the air fresheners we use, but this is just a little something I'm simmering for, you know, a uh, half an hour to an hour at a time. So it is, uh, you know, potentially a good thing for our pets too. Cinnamon prevents yeast infections. Um, but what you don't want to do is ever, ever, ever let the pet chew on cinnamon sticks, which are actually the bark of small trees that are grown in Brazil, um, I think Venezuela, India, Vietnam, Indonesia, different places like that. Um, and if you are feeding it to your pet, limit it to about an eighth of a teaspoon for every 15 pounds your dog weighs. Um, if your pet is diabetic, don't do this without asking your veterinarian. Ask your veterinarian, but sometimes that little bit of cinnamon might help regulate um, your pet's blood sugar. So just, um, you know, take care with that and don't overdo it because cinnamon does have a mild anti-clotting effect. So we certainly don't want that going on with our pet. Now, those are a whole bunch of the good things off of our table that we can share with our pets as long as we don't add what? <laughs> the butters, the oils, the salts. But there are some things I really want your senior dogs to avoid. The first one is the gravy, the butter, the skin, and the grizzle. <laughs> um, these are all high in fat. They're loaded with salts and spices and just other dangerous ingredients that can cause gastrointestinal upsets and pancreatitis. And you know, when the pancreas gets inflamed, we have a pet in an emergency situation. So stay away from the greasy things and the salty things. And that actually includes the turkey skin. Um, I know it's crispy and brown and you think the dog's gonna love it, but it just may be too much for them. Um, the turkey itself though, once again, is an excellent source of protein for our dogs, as long as we keep it unseasoned. So just remember all of these special little marinades, gravies and butters um, are to be avoided, as are the bones from the turkey. And you know, take this down to the last moment when you're throwing away that turkey carcass, make sure it's in a place where your dog can't find it in the garbage can. Raw bones, knuckle bones, you know, cow type bones can be good for your pets to chew on. Um, but cooked chicken or turkey bones will um, splinter and they can puncture and they can cause intestinal blockages. So please make sure your pets do not get cooked turkey bones. Do not give them um, a turkey leg to chew on. That is a super, super bad idea. Now, there are a few spices and other things that we, um, you know, do put into our meals that I just want you to be aware of. Onions and chives can cause what's called Heinz body anemia. It actually has to do with um, breaking down the red blood cells, making sure there's not enough oxygen in there. And what, what it basically can cause is renal failure in your pet. If your dog, you know, gets something with a little bit of onion, I know sometimes people feed 
uh, chicken broth, um, and they're so careful about getting the non-sodium kind for their pets, but they don't realize there's onions in them. If it's just a little bit, it's probably not going to be an issue for your pet. But there's no reason for us to, you know, be giving our pets onions and chives for this reason, because it can cause kidney problems. Garlic is in kind of the same family, but it, there's different bits of you know, theories about it. And people feel that in moderation, garlic can be okay. But again, there's really no reason to feed our pets garlic. There are some veterinarians that say it does help with um, flea and pest control. That may be one of the reasons your pet might be on it. But, you know, find out from your veterinarian if your pet really needs garlic, if there are other options, and in what amounts. Sage and nutmeg, though, are two of the Thanksgiving spices our pets absolutely can do without. Um, sage, which may be in sausages or it may be in our Thanksgiving dressing or stuffing, whatever you call it, um, actually is essential oils. And essential oils are toxic, more so even for cats, but they are for dogs as well. And nutmeg can um, affect the central nervous system. So please go ahead and feed that pumpkin and that sweet potato plain. But if you've added the nutmeg, pause off. Now, there are some dogs, I, apparently, um, mine have never been allowed to try. I, I feel like they're always their whole life going to be underage. But there are some dogs that might enjoy the taste of beer or wine, but there's no reason for them to ever taste it. Um, just like us, it'll have the same effects multiplied because their body weight is smaller. And the, um, what is it, the hops in the beer can actually be very toxic to our dogs. So just be very careful. A tiny little spill or looking at a wine glass, especially if you have like a Yorkie or a Chihuahua, that can be problematic. It seems like very little, but in relation to their body weight, it can be an issue. And then I promised you I was gonna circle back to nuts because they're kind of an almonds, uh, an autumn staple, if you'll have it. Um, and they're found in many, many of our dishes and breads, uh, maybe in stuffings, maybe just in a bowl like you see here on a table. But while some nuts are fine in moderation, like peanuts, the thing to always remember about peanuts and the peanut butter, um, number one is nuts are harder for our pets to digest. So that's why they typically do okay with the peanut butter. But read those labels. If there's xylitol in that peanut butter, that makes it problematic. But the other two nuts I want to mention are walnut and macadamia. And those are really no-nos for our senior dog. Um, black walnuts are what kind of grow wild, and those are extremely toxic. What you're going to find in orchards and probably in your grocery store are English walnuts, but still, um, they're harder for our pets to digest, and they can pro cause problems. Macadamia nuts may actually cause paralysis. It's often um, temporary, but still, you know, it's not something we want our pets to have. And should a friend from Hawaii or somewhere else have sent you a box of chocolate covered macadamia nuts, that's a double whammy because the theobromine and the chocolate is gonna speed up your pet's heart and lungs, pull fluid out of the bodies and could potentially result in seizures. So other than peanut butter, I'd say, you know, keep paws off nuts and in the peanut butter even do so in moderation, just a little bit. All right, I hope I'm staying on screen here. I'm trying to reach in to click my clicker. And for some reason, I can't see the video today. So I'm hoping I'm not popping out a screen for you. But um, raisins and currants. And again, these are things that are going to be in holiday breads. Um, some people put them in stuffings. But um, there's been a huge mystery, I think, for like 20 years, why grapes and raisins are toxic to dogs. And only recently did they figure it out. It's the tartaric acid, um, and that's also found in cream of tartar. And interestingly enough, the way it was found out is through a homemade recipe of Play-Doh. Um, you know, Play-Doh and different kinds of doughs and dough ornaments that people make are typically flour, sugar, and water, but some also have a recipe of cream of tartar. And that's a, do a dog ingested that, and they found out that too was in the raisins and grapes. So please no raisins, grapes, currants. It can 
really shut down your pet's kidneys, cause kidney failure and death rather quickly. Um, so keep those away. And unbaked dough. Now I'm not talking about the bread that you've already baked or the bread you got at the grocery store, but the unbaked baked dough with the yeast that's rising on your counter and is smelling wonderful, keep it out of paw's reach. I actually found a case study last week and, and Amanda um, on our team here, always keeping a lookout too, found it as well and sent it my way. But it was something sent to the Pet Poison Helpline. Pippa was a playful pup in Knoxville, Tennessee. You see her here. And she was one of these dogs that had a, a history of retrieving things from her family's countertop. Um, she almost ruined Thanksgiving a few years ago, but fortunately is well and happy. But what she did was she consumed some of these raw biscuits um, raising on the counter. Unbaked dough that contains yeast will expand. That's what it's doing. It's rising. And when it gets in that warm belly of your dog, it continues to rise. That's a perfect environment for it. And it's going to release carbon dioxide which then can extend the stomach into what's called bloat, increase the heart rate, cut off the blood supply, and cause the dog to collapse and potentially die. Additionally, the um, yeast uses sugars to ferment, so it can actually cause alcohol poisoning in the pets. So be so careful about anything you have rising, even if it's on the back of the counter, put something in the front, um, make sure dogs cannot get to it at counter surf. When Pippa arrived at the emergency room, um, it had been already too long for them to induce vomiting. It, you know, the dough had pretty much kind of left her stomach and started getting into the intestinal tract and the lumen, the part of her tummy that goes from the tummy to the intestines, they said was 90% full of dough. So what they did is they put her on IV fluids. They tried to get cold water into her to counteract the dough from rising. And fortunately, she didn't require surgery, but it was an expensive and uncomfortable Thanksgiving for Pippa. Um, so we don't want that to happen to any other pets. I was also reading other stories about dogs that have stolen, you know, yeast doughs off the counter and then gone to lay in the sun. And that combination of that warmth, um, the pets have unfortunately passed away. So please, please keep out of paw's reach. And last on our foods here, I want to talk about corn cobs. If your holiday meal includes fresh corn, um, just be so careful that your pet doesn't grab the cob. It's, it's, they're just so quick at it. And the cobs cannot be digested. And if swallowed, they can become an intestinal blockage. So we really, you know, they can get caught in the back of the throat or if they make it down there, sometimes they'll bite it into a few pieces quickly and swallow it so it'll go farther. But we just want to be so careful that we don't have any doggy disasters during the holiday season or any time of the year. So since corn cobs could potentially lead to choking hazards, I want to talk to you a little bit about how to help a pet who is choking. Now when our pets choke, um, we typically want to give them a moment to cough. If they're still having you know, troubles and seem to be in distress, we can take a look inside their mouth and see if we can reach the object. If we can't reach the object, um, we're gonna go on to basically a Heimlich-like maneuver. And if that doesn't work after several attempts, we have a technique called chestless. But there's also something brand new that went viral about this time last year called the external extraction technique for just certain circumstances so I'm gonna take you through some of these quickly today. So when our dog is choking, you know, there's gonna be that gasping sound. They may be coughing, they may be pawing at the mouth trying to get something out. Even if they're making a terrible sound, that's actually a good thing because it means there's an air exchange. They're taking in air and they're able to expel it. When the pet goes silent, that's when we're super concerned because that means there's now a blockage to the lungs, the pet isn't breathing and ultimately he'll also go into cardiac arrest. So like I mentioned a moment before, it's always a good idea to give our pets a moment to cough on their own. I don't think they know what gravity is, but they typically will bend their heads down as they cough trying to expel the object out. And very often they're successful. Often our main goal then is to get that object away with a distraction before they suck it back in again. 
But if they aren't able to get it out, we're going to take a look inside. But to do so carefully, we want to put our hands over the top of their snout here, wrapping their, cane, their lips around their canine teeth, and then pulling down with our other hand, pulling the tongue forward to take a look. I want you to look. Don't just grab. If you reach into a pet's mouth without looking, you can push the object farther back and actually have it lock the windpipe and the pet will go unconscious. If you just reach in there and pull something out, you can actually tear laryngeal tissue or pull out a tooth or cause damage. So make sure you can see it. But do also realize that when some pets are in distress, they may not want you near their mouth. So, you know, this may not be an option, but if you are able to take a look inside and get the object out, then do a good examination of the mouth afterwards. This beautiful chocolate lab had this stick caught and his family got the stick out, yay! <laughs> but then the doggy wouldn't eat for a couple of days. So they took her to the vet and this is what the vet, vet discovered. The stick had done some major damage. So even though you get the obstruction out, realize the job isn't done, do a good examination of the mouth to make sure you still don't need to get to veterinary care. Let me play a quick little video here for you because I think you can see it better on the video if it'll play nicely. If not, I will just demonstrate, but I think you can get a better view of it here of what are called abdominal thrusts. Now, I always used to refer to this as the Heimlich like maneuver, but I actually learned that Dr. Henry Heimlich developed the technique on beagles. He had six beagles who, um, unfortunately, he did large chunks of meat they choked and figured out a way to alleviate that obstruction. So let's see if we can get this going here. And you can learn abdominal thrusts, aka the Heimlich maneuver. Hang with me. <laughs> I'll talk you through it if it doesn't come out good, but I just thought you could see better here than in my setup in the kitchen. If this were a human friend. Denise, the floor. We can see your video, but we can't hear what you're what's happening in the video, your instructions. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? Let me just let it play. I don't know why you're not hearing it, and then I'm gonna and I'll talk you through it. That'd be awesome. Thank you. That's in a normal so we want to leave them in their four on the floor position. Downward. Even slightly to downward. downward. I'm just lifting up the dog to show you where the ribs are, that they make a triangle. And at the bottom of the last rib, there's a soft part of the belly, and that's where we place the fist or just the flat fingers if it's a smaller cat. If it's a smaller pet, just two fingers on top of each other. If it's a larger one, the fist covering. And we want to make sure there's no gap between us. But I'm going to actually stop the video. I think we're having a little internet thingy here. What I can always do for everyone is give you the link to the, whoops, the link to it so you can view it later. I, internet's just been wackadoodle lately. But um, let me just talk you through the pictures here and I'll be happy to share those YouTube videos with you so you can watch them carefully. But what you wanna do for abdominal thrust, like I was mentioning, find the triangle on the belly of your pet where the ribs attach. After the last rib, there's a soft part of the belt. For smaller pets, you're gonna just put two fingers there with two fingers on top. For our bigger ones, we're gonna put our fist here and cover with our other hand. But the way I'm doing it right now and the way you see it in that third picture is not correct in that we don't ever want to have the pet upright. That's actually giving a gravity assist for the object to slide farther down the throat. 
So I'm just doing this so you can actually see how the fingers would fit or the fist, but what you would do is tabletop yourself. If it's a big dog, you may be like I am there in the second picture on my knees or stoop down. For a little one, you're just going to tabletop and pull the pet up to you. But the point or the <laughs> I hope you guys aren't hearing that. <laughs> the video started up again. Um, but what you want to do is make sure there's no um You want to make sure there's no um, space between you and the pet, and you want to pull up towards yourself. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And hopefully the object will come out. Um, you're not swinging with momentum. You shouldn't be causing any bruising. This is what we call abdominal thrusts. If, however, for some reason, after a couple attempts, this isn't working, uh-oh, what happened to the computer now? It doesn't want to advance. We're not going to try that video today. I'm going to put in the link somewhere. I will put the videos for you guys. Let me just try to get to the slide. This, however, is not a human. One second. Whoa! I don't know if you're seeing all the wackadoodle things going on on the computer that I am. I hope not. But let me just try to get to the next one here, which are chest thrusts. So this would be our next step should the abdominal thrust not work. And what we're going to do is literally squeeze the air out of lungs to make a uh, creative force and propel the object. Sailing down. across the face. Um, Dogs and cats have more flexible ribs than we do. So just take their front leg and bend an elbow back. And where the elbow touches the chest, that's going to be the location to do those chest thrusts. I see it's advanced on me again, but I just want you to see that's the next technique. Okay. Now, the external extraction technique, boy, my computer is just jumping around here, but the external extraction technique is only for dogs that have swallowed a ball and they've got a complete airway blockage. Forgive me for laughing. I've got like two videos playing and I'm just having a few here listening to myself going over and over. But what this is for is you see right there, the ball is caught over the trachea. And you know what I'm going to do? Hang on. Denise, I think we've actually defaulted back to your. Podcast. I'm actually trying to stop the slides here so that I can just talk to you for the last moment. Perfect. Oh, this is beautiful. I don't know if you guys can still see that photo. I'm trying to get rid of it, but that's what I'm going to pick up on right there as soon as it'll let me. One second. I apologize. Technical difficulties for real. Just the way of the world these days, Denise. Weren't we talking about? I know. <laughs> Are you seeing me? We Are see you. Are you seeing me or hearing me? Both. Both. Wonderful. Okay, good. Well, I can't see a thing. Uh, what I just want to tell you about the external extraction technique is this is just for dogs that have swallowed a ball or something soft and it's caught above their trachea. Everybody, take your hands like this. And you know, you've got a V-shaped jawbone here. And with your thumbs, you can feel your trachea. It's kind of a rib tube there that leads to the, leads to the airway. What you're doing in dogs that have this problem is you're gonna get your thumbs behind that ball. You'll be able to see it. You're gonna turn the doggy on his back and straddle him. You're gonna be behind the front legs. And then you're gonna make this diamond shape
All right, I see that Denise is frozen, so we're just going to give her a moment to see if she can reconnect with us. I know we all can um, empathize with technology and its quirkiness. Um, so we'll just give her just a minute to see if she can rejoin us. Why we're waiting to see if Denise is able to join us back. I know I was sharing that Denise has definitely inspired me to get in the kitchen to make these easy treats. So I didn't know if anybody else um, is also thinking about making these and seeing how they go over with their pets for the holiday season. If you are, you um, do a shout out in the webinar chat. Or on Facebook in the comments. So Amanda's on board with me. She's going to be making them as well for her two dogs for Thanksgiving. And so is Christine. I agree. They look easy and delicious. I am not um, a baker myself, nor do I think I have any skills in the kitchen whatsoever, but I'm happy to try to see if I can make these happen. Because <laughs> I know my senior dog is all about anything that he can eat. So I think we lost Denise, um, probably for good. Um, so we'll just go ahead and still um, see if she, give her another you know, couple seconds to see if she's a bit gonna come back online with us. Otherwise, we'll just go ahead and wrap things up. And Ingrid also said, yep, she's gonna make them. Um, does anybody else have any things that they bake that they would want to share with the rest of us. That would be an interesting um, idea for the holidays or just any day. I know I've made some like custom made uh, biscuits in the past um, that have turned out really well in some like different custom shapes. Uh, as I said before, I'm not really like a baker, so I'm Sure, they could turn out a lot better than how I make them, but my dog liked them, so that was good. Christine says she's going to probably try making them as many muffins as she has three. They're 50, 55, and 30 pounds. And the smaller, the, smaller, the more I can give, that is true. I um, always feel like I'm in a shortage of treats at my house. And yes, we'll be sure to send out um, Denise's video links and the recipe um, as in the follow-up email. And it looks like Denise was maybe be able to join us. Oh my goodness, I was talking away. I don't know when I lost you guys. I am so sorry, but I'm on my phone here and I had recapped. So I did you hear the recap of all of the choking or not, Laura? We did not. Oh my goodness. Well, while I have these in my hand, let me just show you the end result of the um, turkey muffins here with the cranberry on top, which Kiko doesn't get because she doesn't like cranberry. But what I just wanted to do the recap, and I will be sure to make sure you guys get video links so that you can see those techniques, is that for choking, we always give the dog a moment to cough on his own. If he can't cough it up and we're able to do so safely, we're going to take a look inside his mouth. If we're lucky enough to get the object out, we're gonna then do an examination to make sure no damage was done. But if we're not able to get the object out, we're gonna do our abdominal thrusts, which are like a Heimlich maneuver in which you're going to press on the diaphragm to create a force to propel the object out. If after two or three attempts, that's not successful, we're gonna press on the side of the chest, squeezing the air out of the lungs to make a force. 
Remember, dogs' ribs are more flexible than ours, but we're not squeezing with any momentum like this. We're just squeezing like a, a bellows on a fireplace. And for those doggies that have swallowed a ball or a large chunk of meat and have gone completely unconscious, we're gonna turn them on their backs and do that external extraction technique where you find that rib trachea and put your thumb below the ball and basically massage it out towards their mouth with J strokes with both thumb until you alleviate that obstruction. Do you realize a pet that has gone unconscious isn't necessarily gonna jump up on his feet afterwards. You may need to know how to do rescue breathing um, in order to get that pet back on his feet and get him quickly to veterinary care. So I think that's kind of where I left off. I don't know where I lost you guys before, but I'm delighted to answer any questions. And again, apologies for the internet. I don't know, thanks for being flexible and keeping up with us and joining us back on your phone. That was a <laughs> Um, I know I have a question when you were talking about the compressions um, and repeating them five times and what is like your count in between the set of five? Excellent question. And what I will say is I'm gonna take away the word compression from what you use only sure. because I always try to use the word thrust when we're talking about choking because we save compressions for when we're doing actually CPR and compressing on the heart. So what we're gonna be doing is thrusting and it would be like this. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, at about that tempo. We wanna build that momentum rather quickly so that we are creating that force to propel the object out. So same tempo, whether it was on the abdominal area or on the side on the rib cage. And the reason I always have people do the Heimlich first where we're pressing on the diaphragm is because that's less invasive, honestly. More people are worried about pressing on the rib cage. But like I said, you know, dogs have more flexible ribs than we do. And of course, there's always a potential for breaking them. But if we're not going to do anything because we're worried about breaking the ribs, we're not going to have a pet. And I was also thinking that I have not experienced this myself, hopefully, um, with my pet choking. But if they if they are choking and you're trying these techniques, do you have sort of a recommendation to say, like, you if you try it for so many times and aren't seeing a response, then, you know, move forward to X, Y, and Z? Or, or these are some signs you should be looking for that maybe this is, you know, successful. Um, these techniques exactly. are having a successful result. Exactly. Um, with the Heimlich, I typically do it no more than three times because each time you're doing five thrusts. So that would be up to 15 thrusts on the abdomen. And if that isn't solving the problem, I would then move on to the chest thrust. And those are a little more effective because you're literally squeezing the air out of the lungs, which is closer to the throat. So it's creating a stronger force. But throughout any of this, if the pet is still conscious, like I said, if he's making a noise, or you can see there's an air exchange. If you can be on your way to veterinary care, if you feel that you are gonna be having difficulty getting the object out, that's always the smart thing. But once the pet has gone unconscious, um, rolling them on their back, if it is something like a ball and doing that external extraction technique is very beneficial. Or if um, you can't do that for some reason, just getting them on a side, and doing um, that, that chest thrust, but just from one side, one, two, three, four, five, and opening their mouth, pulling their tongue forward and seeing if you can reach the object. As much as we don't wanna see a pet go unconscious, once they have, we don't have a fear of being bitten and they're not struggling against us. So you'd be amazed how long, you know, even 30 seconds is um, if you're trying to get an object out of a pet and most people are able to do it. We just, unfortunately, Laura, don't have statistics on how um, super successful these techniques are because there's no national database to say, hey, I did the Heimlich today and my dog survived. But, <laughs> but you know, talking to veterinarians, um, most of the time when there's somebody there that can either keep that airway open or try to alleviate the obstruction, we have a good turnout. But just you know, supervise your pets around bones, around toys. There's no such thing as an um, 
indestructible toy. There's some dog out there that can break pieces off of it. That's so very true. And, and I so appreciate you sharing all this information with us today because I know it's something that I've always been curious on, but haven't, you know, had the um, experience come up where I needed to know this in the moment, but I just feel so much more prepared now that I have this information that if it does occur, I have knowledge to be able to move forward and see if I can help my dog who's choking or my cat. Well, wonderful. And I will send over those links to you to those videos right away so that people can go back and look at the techniques and practice them. But don't practice them on a pet that doesn't need them. Practice them on a <laughs> stuff. <animal. laughs> that is an excellent point as well. So we so appreciate your time and sharing your expertise with us today, Denise. Um, as I mentioned, I'm better prepared and I hope others are too, to be able to create a safe and enriching environment for their senior dogs, uh, not only in our lives for this holiday season, but for every day. Um, you truly are a treasure and we can't thank you enough for being with us today. And I hope that you'll consider joining us again in the future. Um, so big round of applause to you, Denise. Thank you so much. And I just want to send out a reminder or share a reminder to those that are joining us or potentially watching this um, recorded that we will be taking um, December off from the series, but we will be back in January and we look forward to connecting with you in 2023. So wishing you all a safe and happy holidays.